Okay, we're talking about God's grace this morning. And so other definitions of God's grace might go God's riches at Christ's expense. Another way to talk about God's grace is just to say it's his goodness. It's God's generosity. And in Christ, we see how generous God is. Or we can say it this way, God's grace is his eagerness and his willingness to give to us good and great gifts. And I just want us to focus on God's grace. In fact, the, the reason you're here this morning, and I'm here, or that anybody goes to church, is because of God's grace. God has shown us his grace in Christ, and we have responded to that grace through faith. And that's why we're here. So what does God's grace do for us? Well, it humbles me. It cuts me down to size. It makes me realize all that I have, it's because God gave it to me freely without my deserving it. See, I can't pat myself on the back. Oh, God, you've done all this for me because I'm so good. Oh, no, not, none of that, none of that. It's, it humbles me. I'm humbled to think of the extent of God's grace that he's poured out upon me. And then God's grace moves me to gratitude. It makes me just want to jump up and down and shout for joy and say, Thank you, Lord, for giving me all this in Christ that I didn't work for and I didn't deserve. And then God's grace moves me to obedience. Lord, how can I respond? How can I thank you? For all the grace you've done for me. I, I just want to obey you. I want to please you. I want to live for you because of the outpouring of your grace in Christ. And then God's grace, when I think about the generosity and the kindness that God has shown me in Christ, it makes me realize, hey, I need to be showing that grace and kindness to others. Other people need to see God. And they're going to see God in my life and in your life. And so we want to show God to others by being gracious. So number one, God's grace comes to us in Christ Jesus. God's grace comes to us in Christ Jesus. So let's start in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, please feel free to follow along. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. And uh, we'll take all the passages this morning. That will actually all be in order as we go. So that will make it a little easy for us to move from one passage to the other. So the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And here the Apostle John is giving the introduction to his entire gospel. And he talks about Jesus as being the eternal life-giving word that was with God the Father in the beginning. So this points to the eternality, the eternality of Jesus, or the eternality of the Son of God. And we also learn that Jesus was there with God the Father. I should say the Son of God was there with God the Father and participated in the creation of all things. We get down to verse 14. Having talked about this eternal life-giving word, the Apostle John says in verse 14, and the word became flesh. In other words, became human. The word assumed a human body. And the word became flesh and dwelt, actually dwelt among us. And when Christmas comes up, we usually remember how extraordinary that is to think of the eternal life-giving word that was there in the beginning, co-created with God the Father Almighty, who participated in the creation of all things, dwelt among us sinful people on earth. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we, we, people on earth, we beheld his, what glory? We beheld the glory, the magnificence, the grandeur of this eternal life-giving word who assumed a human body and dwelt among us. It is the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So it's a glory that's appropriate for one who is the Son of God. And now notice the last words of verse 14. What, is, what does this glory show us? What does this glory reveal to us? Full of grace and truth. So this eternal life-giving word assumed a human body, became flesh, lived among us, and we had the privilege, we had the privilege and the opportunity to see the glory of the eternal Son of God who became human, and that glory consisted of, of grace, the grace of God, the grace of Jesus, and truth. Now think of grace, again, as God's kindness, God's generosity, God's goodness. Think of truth as truthfulness, or that might come out as God's faithfulness. In Christ, God was fulfilling lots of Old Testament promises, all those promises God made to Abraham, all those promises God made to David. God is fulfilling those in Jesus, so God is showing us not only grace, but truth, his truthfulness, his faithfulness, that God does what he says he's going to do. So we see just grace in Christ. Now let's look at verse 15. John, that's John the Baptist, bore witness of him, of Jesus, and cried out, saying, this was 
he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me because he what? He was before me. So again, this is reminding us of the pre-existence of Jesus. Now verse 16. Now I think the outline has arrived. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Christina. You're welcome. I guess that won't happen again for a while. So let me just show you all the points. I won't block any of them off for now. But run number one, God's grace comes to us in Jesus Christ. We're in the Gospel of John chapter 1. So now notice verse 16. And of his fullness, this is referring to Jesus, the eternal life-giving word who became human and lived among us. And of his fullness, fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. Now just think about those words. Notice it says fullness. It doesn't say emptiness. Of Jesus' is full. In other words, Jesus came full, and he came to bring us lots of gifts, lots of blessings in Christ. I don't know you, about. I, I like full. I like a full tank of gas. I like kitchen cabinets that are full of food. I like a full refrigerator. We like full. And it says there, of Jesus' is fullness, we have all received. Notice we received. It's like we're receiving a gift. We receive. So this again points to the fact that what we get from Jesus is a gift. We didn't work for it. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. So of his fullness, we have all received. Now notice the next words, and grace for grace. I like to think of that as meaning grace stacked upon grace stacked upon grace. Piles and mountains of grace. It's grace piled on grace piled on grace. Kindness piled up upon kindness. Uh, benefits that we didn't work for and, and deserve piled on top of more benefits that we didn't work for and deserve piled on top of more benefits that we didn't work for and earn and deserve. <clears throat> I remember um, as a teenager, we, we had lived in Burlington, and uh, my father decided he wanted to redo the front lawn. It, it didn't have very much topsoil, very little topsoil, and, and, and so... My father decided to call, I think it was J.E. Farmer up and Bill Ricker and send over some truckloads alone. And so they came over with a 10-wheeler. And I remember watching the 10-wheeler back up, big 10-wheeler truck, and they dumped the loam. And you could, you, you could smell the farm in that loam, you know, you know what I mean by that? You could smell the farm. <laughs> and so, it, it, incidentally, the teachers in Bet at Burlington at the time all went out on strike. So my brother and I didn't have to go to school. So now my brother and I, we have plenty of time on our hands to spread out all that loam. But what stands in my mind is those truckloads, big truckloads, backing up with all that nice topsoil. And you have to spread it around with the wheelbarrow and put down the grass. But that's what I think of when I think of this verse. Truckload after truckload after truckload of God's grace. Ten-wheeler after ten-wheeler after ten-wheeler just, just giving us all this grace, all this kindness. And I believe as Christians, God wants us to appreciate the enormity the size, the amount of God's grace that he's given to us in Christ that we didn't work for, we didn't earn, and we don't deserve. And it's going to last for all eternity. And we're only in this life, we're only getting just started in the experience and the enjoyment of God's grace. It's going to last forever. Now, let's read on. <clears throat> so what I want to say is verse 16 is a very big, powerful verse. And of his fullness, not emptiness, we're not talking about something that's small or God is doling out little by little. Of his fullness, we have all received, received as a gift. Grace for grace. Grace and more grace. Okay, now verse 17. <coughs> for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So again, my first point here is God is showing and pouring out his grace in Christ. Now, the law was given through Moses, all well and good, but what does that do? Well, the law given through Moses exposes our sin and shows us that we're sinners and condemns us as sinners. But the law given through Moses doesn't do anything on my inside to make me love God and give me any ability to do his law. <coughs> yes, we might want to please God, we want to do his law, but the law in and of itself was weak to change me on the inside to give me the capacity to actually do God's will. Yes, the law is pure, it's good, it's holy, says the Apostle Paul in Romans. But the law was given through Moses, but what came through Jesus is far better. Because God's grace delivers me from the condemnation of the law. The law points the accusatory finger at me and says, I'm a sinner. And I stand condemned before a holy God. But God's grace can take care of that and free me from the penalty of the law. Furthermore, 
what the law could not do. It could not give me the ability or the capacity to keep God's commandments. God's grace does. God's grace works in me and gives me the desire, the capacity, the ability through the Holy Spirit to keep God's commandments. So, wow. This grace, what John is saying here as he opens up his gospel, is this grace that has come to us through the life-giving uh, word that was there, coexisted with God the Father, who participated in the creation of all things, is big. It is big. God's grace comes to us in Christ, and we need to sit up and take notice because this is really, really big. All right, number two. God's grace is the heart of the gospel. When we think about the good news of Jesus Christ, what is it about that good news that makes it so special, so amazing, so wonderful? It's the fact that God is pouring out his grace in Christ. The gospel is all about Jesus Christ. It's what God is doing in Jesus for us. And at the center of that message is the grace of God. So now, let's go to Acts, if you will. So just go over to Acts. That's the next book in your New Testament. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And so the Apostle Paul is meeting with the uh, elders from Ephesus. He's called them down to where he is to meet with them, to give them some exhortation. And I want you to notice here simply what or how, I should say this, how, just notice how the Apostle Paul refers to the gospel. So now Acts chapter 20, notice verse 24. Verse 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. There it is. Paul calls the gospel the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel is primarily about God's wonderful and awesome and enormous grace revealed and shown and given to us in Jesus Christ. Now, if you will, look down at verse 32. Verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. So now we have the word of the message of God's grace. The message of God's grace. And this may not refer just to the gospel alone, but to the, all, the whole New Testament revelation. It's the message, it's the word of God's grace. The New Testament is all about God's grace being brought to us and revealed in Jesus. And again, keep in mind what grace is. It's just God's kindness. It's God's generosity. It's God, uh, God's goodness to unworthy and undeserving sinners. All right, let's get down to point number three. Let me just slide this up a little more so we can see it a little better. Let's get down to point number three. Okay, now we're going to go over to Romans, and all the rest of the passages will be in Romans. So number three, we're justified by God's grace. So let's go to Romans 3, if you will. Romans 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. So we're justified, we're put in the right with God by his grace. In other words, not by our works, not by our deeds, not by our achievements, not by our own effort or our attempts at self-improvement. So notice now verse 23. I realize I'm breaking into the middle of a sentence as we have it here in the English version. So Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all falling short of God's glory. Uh, that might mean we're not praising God as we should, we're not thanking him as we should, or our lives don't show how glorious he is. We're not living those obedient lives that are surrendered to God um, in faith, and our lives just don't show his glory. We're sinners, unworthy, ungodly. And by the way, there'll be the glory. The glory theme will continue throughout the New Testament, how God is going to put his glory back in us. Get the Romans 8, we'll see how uh, we're going to inherit the glory of God in the future when Jesus comes. But now notice verse 24. Verse 24. 
being justified, in other words, we don't justify ourselves, we're being acted upon by God, being justified freely, in other words, as a free gift, being justified freely by his grace, by his goodness, by his generosity, by his kindness that he shows to unworthy and undeserving sinners. And how are we justified by his grace? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, through the liberation and the freedom that comes to us when we put our faith and trust in Christ. That redemption implies that a price has been paid, a ransom price has been paid, and as a consequence, we have been set free, and we now belong to God, and we belong to Jesus. So there it is. Very plain, very clear, we're justified as a free gift by God's grace through the redemption that comes to us in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. So if I don't live a perfect, sinless life, although I would like to, as, as, as a way of saying thank you to God, I don't need to beat myself up and feel like I'm not a saved person. We still sin. We still miss the mark of doing God's will. But as far as my relationship with God is concerned, from a judicial point of view, Jesus fully paid for all of my sin. And we can rejoice in the Lord every day just knowing that. Christ has paid for my sins, and I have been put in the right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go to number four. Number four. So God only, as a believer now, I should say, as a believer, God only treats me according to grace. God only treats me. God only deals with me according to grace. In other words, I am not going to suffer the wrath and the eternal judgment of God on my sin. Any and all thoughts of, of having to suffer God's wrath on my sins is taken away completely, totally. That's why uh, we Christians, uh, we don't believe in purgatory. It's not in the Bible. Um, and those who believe in purgatory, I think, have a hard time reconciling that with the fact that Jesus fully paid for all of their sins on the cross. Either Jesus fully paid for all of your sins on the cross, or he didn't pay for all of your sins on the cross. And either the work of Christ on the cross is completely sufficient to save you and deliver you from all of your sins for all eternity, or it is not sufficient. You can't have it both ways. So let's go to Romans chapter 5 now. Just flip the page. Romans chapter 5. So God only deals with me or treats me according to grace. So notice these words now. And verse 1 is a summary verse summarizing what the Apostle Paul has said so far. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just focus on these words before we get to verse 2. So we are justified. In other words, we don't justify ourselves. We are the ones being acted upon. God is the one who justifies. We're justified by faith. And what Paul is arguing is that we're not justified by our works, our deeds, our efforts, our attempts at self-improvement. We're justified by faith. And what do we have as a consequence of putting our faith in Christ? What do we have? We have peace with God. There it is. We have peace with God. Forever we're reconciled to God. It's not like we're reconciled to God for a while, and then somehow we don't have peace with God anymore. No, no, no. We're reconciled to God completely, fully, forever, through faith in Jesus. And Paul emphasizes there, it's through Jesus. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through what? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what else do we get through Jesus? Notice verse 2 now. Through whom? Through Jesus. Also, we also have access by faith. So Paul's emphasizing the, the faith part again. We also have access by faith into this grace. We have access into this state of grace. We have access into this environment of grace. We have access into this condition of of grace, This grace that goes along with being justified. We're justified by grace. So the minute we're justified by grace, we have access, we have our entrance into peace with God that also keeps us forever in the state of grace. Um, I might ask you, what is your address? Some might say, I live in Bill Ricca. Some might say, I live in Bedford. Some might say, I live in Tewksbury. We all have what we might call a physical address. But we also have a spiritual address. Where do we live spiritually? In the grace of God. That's where I live. I live in the, I live in the house of grace, 
just as we're in this room and we're, we're bounded, you might say, by walls and a ceiling and a floor, we're kind of boxed in in this room, we're also boxed in, you might say, in a good way, in the grace of God. We're going to be in God's grace. And if you look your eye down, just look at uh, verse um, 9. Notice verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. We're saved from the wrath of God. We're saved from the judgment of God on our sins forever. So we're in God's grace. God is only going to deal with me. He's only going to act towards me in grace, in love. Even when I sin and disobey him, it's not that God is just going to you know, turn a blind eye. God's going to discipline me. God's going to chasten me. God's going to work through the convicting uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit to bring me back to that place of, of, of contrition and repentance. But God loves me. God's grace is what is acting upon me now all the time. God is always treating me in his grace. So just remember that when the troubles and trials come along. It doesn't mean that you've fallen out of grace and God doesn't love you anymore. No, God is still acting upon you according to his grace. Now, let's just go back up to verse 2. We didn't quite finish verse 2. So through whom, through Jesus, we also have access or our entrance, our introduction by faith into this grace. I like to call it this state of grace, this condition of grace, this environment of grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, in the original language, that's a perfect tense verb. In which we have come to stand and we continue to stand. Completed action with ongoing results. So we're now in God's grace forever. And I just want us all to realize how wonderful that is, how good that is. And I want you all, including myself, just to be jumping up and down, praising the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have moved me out of being a lost, condemned sinner and now I am in your grace. I'm an object of your grace. I live and breathe and move in the environment and in the condition of your grace. Praise the Lord. All right, one last point for this morning. Number five. Hope you can all see that good. Number five. So we're victorious over sin and death by God's grace. And you might say this is an elaboration of, her, of, of point number three. That's just, we're justified by God's grace. But this tells us in a little more detail what it means to be justified. We're victorious. We're triumphant over sin and all of its consequences by God's grace. So now, if you will, go over to Romans chapter, uh, well, still in 5. The reference is 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse, we want to verse 17. Before we get to verse 17, I want you to know now, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, all the way down to verse 21, the word gift is used five times. The word grace is used five times. So you get the idea that the Apostle Paul is trying to drive home the free gift of God that's come to us in God's grace. Ten times. Ten times it's either grace or gift is mentioned. So notice verse, and what the Apostle Paul is saying here, to summarize it. Paul is saying, look, look at all of the results of, of Adam's sin. Adam sinned and rebelled against God, and because we're descendants of Adam, we all inherit a sinful human nature. We all sin, and that brings condemnation, that brings death. So just look at all the terrible results that have come to us because of sin. And then the apostle Paul says, yeah, but look at God's grace. God's grace fixes it all. God's grace cures it all. He remedies, he takes care of all the problems relative to our sin. God's grace is bigger and better than our sin and fixes it. So now with that in mind, notice verse 17. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense, and that would be referring to Adam and his sin, death reigned. In other words, death ruled, death governed through the one. Death ruled, death reigned over the whole uh, lot of sinful humanity. And that's not only just physical death, but spiritual death as well. Much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign, will rule, will govern, will be victorious in life through the one Jesus Christ. You see how God's grace is better than what happened to us through Adam and his sin and our sin as well? Notice those words, much more those who receive. We're in the receiving end. We didn't work for it. When, you know, it, it comes to us as a gift. We simply just receive it as a gift. So we receive. And what do we receive? The abundance of grace. Not just a little bit of grace, not a small amount of grace, not a limited amount of grace, but an abundance, a plentitude of grace that's being poured out to us. So notice how we move from, they might say, the general to the specific here. We receive an abundance of grace, and more specifically, 
we receive the gift of righteousness. And as we do, we will reign, we will rule, we will govern, we will be victorious in this life, in, the, in, in all eternity, through the one person, Jesus Christ. So that's why I say in number five, we're victorious over sin and death by God's grace. And when I put my faith and trust in Christ, not only am I delivered from the penalty of my sin, but I'm also delivered from the power of sin to rule over me and to enslave me. Now, let's move down to verse 18, if you will. Verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act. That would refer to Jesus Christ and his righteous act of dying on the cross in obedience to the will of God the Father. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in, condom uh, resulting in the justification of life. So the free gift has come to all men in the sense of it's available to all men. The free gift is available. The gospel is available. We still need to believe. We still need to receive God's grace. Now notice verse 19. For by one man's disobedience, that would be the disobedience of Adam, for by one man's disobedience, many, many were made sinners. Even the whole human race were constituted as sinners. Uh, they inherited Adam's sinful human nature, and therefore they all sinned. So also, by one man's obedience, that would be the obedience of Jesus, who lived a life of perfect obedience to the will of God the Father and obeyed God so much so that he went to the cross, even so, by the one man's obedience, many, what? Notice what it says here. Many will be made righteous. You will, potentially speaking, righteousness is available, but you have to receive it. We have to believe in Jesus. We have to respond to the gospel. So many will be made righteous, and we receive what is, is according to verse 17, we receive the gift. The gift of righteousness. God just gives me this, this free gift and, and a status. He says, I, I, I look at you as righteous. Our sins were transferred to Jesus, and Jesus transfers to me his righteousness. And God sees me as righteous in Jesus. Now verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, God gave the law so that we'd really understand that we're really sinners. Not just a little bit sinful, but very much sin, sin, sinners. But big time sinners. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where, notice this now, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. One commentary says that where sin abounded was when sinful human beings nailed Jesus to the cross. That's where sin abounded. That's where sin became the strongest. That's where sin was most pronounced, when, when human beings took the eternal Son of God and nailed him to a cross. So where sin abounded, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, there God's grace, what does it say? Superabounded. God's grace overflowed all the more and was able to conquer and overrule all of the ill effects of Adam's sin. So you can see how now Paul is writing all of this in praise of God's grace, God's kindness, and God's goodness. Now we get down to verse 21. Why has God done all of this? Verse 21, so that as sin has ruled and reigned and governed in death. As sin has reigned in death, as sin has reigned in death for century after century, for millennia after millennia, as sin has ruled over the human race, resulting in death, both physical death and spiritual death, that as sin has reigned in death, even so now, God's grace, grace might reign, grace might rule, grace might be triumphant through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ. Wow, God is good. Through faith in Jesus, we get the gift of righteousness and eternal life, and we're able to reign, we're able to rule, we're able to live victoriously over sin. Uh, we don't have to obey sin. The stronghold of sin on our lives has been broken, and we know that one day, even if we die, one day we'll be raised up from the dead through Jesus, who was also raised from the dead. Let's just look at chapter 6, if you will. Just flip, flip your eye across the page, or turn your eye across the page. Chapter 6, verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. What does that mean? It's, it's, in other words, sin is not going to exercise lordship or mastery over you. It means sin, as a believer in Christ, sin will not uh, be your taskmaster and you will not be enslaved to sin. Why? How is it that we're no longer enslaved to sin? How is it that sin and all the sinful impulses in us are not going to exercise dominion over us? It says, therefore, you are not under the law. You're not under the law. Remember, the law was powerless to do anything on the inside to help us keep God's law. We're not under the law. The law was powerless to enable us to keep God's law. But what are you under? You are under God's grace. 
You're living now under God's grace. God is pouring out his kindness in Christ Jesus, and in Christ Jesus, God is giving us the ability and the willingness and the joy and the delight to keep God's commandments. Do we always succeed? Are we always 100% obedient all the time? No. But the stronghold, the stranglehold of sin around our necks has been broken. And now look down at verse 20. Let's just stay in chapter 6. Notice verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, now in other words, they were living under the dominion of sin in the past, these, these Christians that are now converts, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then of those things of which you were now are ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So these Christians have no more joy, no more pride, no more happiness in all those things of which they now are ashamed. They're ashamed of those things they used to do. Now verse 22, but now, having been set free from sin, having been liberated from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end of everlasting life. For the wages of sin leads to death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 16, and, and of his fullness we have all received. And grace for grace, grace stacked upon grace, benefit stacked upon benefit, gift stacked upon uh, gift. We have all received so much in Christ. Well, let's just wrap it up with Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, 1 to 4. And again, the Apostle Paul, even though the word grace isn't mentioned here, this is what God's grace does, what is mentioned right here. In fact, everything in Romans chapter 8 is brought to us by God's grace in Christ. Wow. We partake of the unsearchable riches in Christ. So now let's just notice uh, Romans 8, Beginning in verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we're no longer being judged and punished and condemned for our sins. Our sins have been all paid for by Christ. Notice verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin. The power, the power that comes to us from God's Holy Spirit who oversees my union with Jesus has made me free, has liberated me from the power of sin and death. And yes, even in this life I have been set free from the power of sin and one day I will be free from the power of death. If I die before Jesus comes, I will be raised from the dead. Now verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He, God, condemned sin in the flesh. God condemned our sin in his flesh and blood body when he was nailed to the cross. And when we put our faith and trust in Christ, we receive God's grace and our sins are forgiven. So that, notice verse 4, so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit and paul argues here that all christians are walking according to the spirit and no longer according to the flesh if we walk according to the flesh we're, we're walking by ourselves without the help and the strength of the spirit but every believer has the gift of the holy spirit and we are allowed to walk in this life according to the spirit well, I've said all of this this morning for us just as God's people, just to take a look at God's grace once again and just say, wow, God's grace is big. It's enormous. It's gigantic. And we just want to close in prayer in a moment and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for pouring out your grace in Christ. May I appreciate your grace more and more. May I be humble. May I give thanks to you. May I want to live for you and may others see. May others see your grace and your generosity in my life and how I treat other people. You want to be a showcase, you might say an advertisement for God's grace. We're saved by grace, we live by grace, we'll enjoy God's grace forever and ever. So let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let's give thanks to God. Lord God, we bow before you and we thank you for pouring out your grace, your kindness, your goodness, your generosity upon us in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we remember that we didn't earn, we didn't work for, and we didn't deserve any of it. In fact, what we did deserve was your eternal judgment. And you've set us free from your wrath and your condemnation forever, thanks to Jesus and his death for us on the cross. So, Lord, help every one of us here, Lord, just to go out and respond to your grace every day. And say, Lord, thank you.
And when we go through troubles and trials and difficulties, may we remember your grace, your grace. We're living in the environment of your grace. And so, Lord, just help us to obey you, to love you, to serve you, and may others see your grace in our lives as we are gracious and kind to other people. Minister your word to each and every one of us according to our need. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. May God bless his word to all of you this morning. Thank <laughs> you.